She's been a competitor at every level, high school, college, Olympic, and professional. And most importantly, we now claim her as our very own superstar. She was named USA Today's National High School Player of the Year in 1988. She went on to a stellar four-year career at the University of Virginia with three trips to the NCAA Final Four. In 2002, ESPN named her one of the top players of the past 25 years. Coach Staley came to USC in 2008 after an impressive run as, as coach at Temple University. In seven short years, she has created a championship foundation built on hard work, defensive effort, and a team-first mentality. I was pleased to be part of a group of her friends and colleagues who went to the Naismith Hall of Fame in Springfield, Massachusetts to see her inducted in 2013. As you know, she's led the Gamecocks to four consecutive NCAA tournaments and for the very first time in Gamecock history to the Final Four. Graduates, please welcome Coach Dawn Staley. President Pestides, members of the Board of Trustees, distinguished faculty, proud parents, family and friends, and of course you, the class of 2015. Thank you so much for allowing me the honor of speaking to you today. But I have to be honest, President Pestides, first, first uh, uh, option of, of speakers was uh, the best scholar, but the best scholar was busy. His second choice uh, was the best athlete. And of course, the best athlete was busy. His third choice was the best looking. I said, what the heck? I can't turn him down three times in a row. <laughs> On a serious note, being placed in situations such as this gives you great cause to look at your life and your career. It occurs to me that most commencement speakers have achieved some level of success, which most observers deem extraordinary. And I suppose that's why I'm here today. Someone believes my achievements through basketball have been extraordinary. Although I'm not sure how I personally define my body of work, but I must admit I've had some remarkable moments. But thinking critically, I was able to narrow my road to this stage down to three distinct things, finding my passion, overcoming disappointment, and making adjustments. And if you don't mind, that's what I'd like to talk about today. My dreams, my journey, all began with passion. And truthfully, I've allowed that passion to guide me. I picked up a basketball at age eight, and my life forever changed. Basketball was never difficult for me. I never felt awkward or unsure. From the moment I picked up a basketball, I just instinctively knew what to do. I felt incomplete when I didn't play, so I played all the time. As I got bigger and stronger, the accolades started coming. And by college, I was on a national stage. And the world just opened up to me. It was that simple. And looking back, I realized how finding my passion early offered me a roadmap, and it gave me my life direction. And in a lot of ways, it kept me focused. If today you're earning a degree in an area in which you are passionate, your map is beginning to take shape. However, parents, you can cover your ears right now. If you are one whose passion eludes you, in about 30 minutes you will receive a degree for which you are not passionate, and you're all but sure you wasted your parents' money you'll never find a job, and you're scared to death, don't be. Time is on your side, but you have to be bold in your pursuit to find the thing that you love. First, get a job. You're a college graduate. <laughs> but, <laughs> but try something different on the side, and when you find it, you'll know. 
It'll be the one thing that you can't stop thinking about. You're constantly visiting its webpage, read every article you can find on it, and you'll start dreaming about it. That's your passion. Okay, parents, you can listen now. Just to be clear, finding your passion doesn't mean life will be without lows or disappointments. It just means you'll be happy doing what you're doing, which I found to be extremely important. Disappointment is a part of life. There's no way around it. You could do everything right, the right way, and, and for the right reasons, and things still may not turn out as planned. My first biggest disappointment came in a few weeks before my college graduation. At the University of Virginia, I was the national player of the year on an Olympic year. I was invited to try out for the Olympic team and showed up for training camp, fully expecting to make the team. Only I didn't. I was cut on the last tryouts, and I was told two things. One, I was too short, and the other was I didn't have enough international experience. Never mind the person the committee chose over me was shorter than me and also had no international experience. Politics. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to understand, when I graduated, graduated from college in 1992, there was no WNBA. For women, the only option for employment or extending her career uh, through basketball was to go overseas and hope to one day make an Olympic team. But secretly for me, making that team meant so much more. See, I grew up in the Raymond Rosen housing projects in North Philadelphia. I learned to play basketball on the courts in the middle of the projects. Every boy in my community helped hone my skills on that court. My entire community followed me through high school and college. They took all of my victories and all of my defeats as their own. My success was their success. Although I couldn't articulate it then, I was the hope of that community, their pride, the one who made it out. I was the real life example of possibility. To not be on that team was not just a dis disappointment to me, it was a disappointment to them. I felt I had let them down and I was devastated. I had no plan B, no agent, no overseas job prospects. I was completely lost. But I did have this degree in rhetoric and communication studies, which was ironic, being that I barely spoke a word to anyone. I was really shy. See, I know a little bit about having a degree and a discipline for which I have no passion. But I also had a proud mother who believed every able body needed to work. She didn't allow me to dwell in my depression very long. Upon hearing I would not be an Olympian, she spoke to a friend who managed a dress shop in Philadelphia and encouraged him to hire me. The day after I returned home, I reported to work. It took one whole day of running away from customers, pretending to be busy, and hiding behind displays to determine I was not cut out for community, for uh, customer service or a traditional nine to five job. As soon as the clock struck five on my first day at work, I got on the phone and called an agent. I remember being so upset at my mother for forcing me to work at the dress shop. I felt like she'd given up on me, that she didn't believe in my dreams. But what she did was she held up a mirror and she said, look, this is your life. If you don't like it, do something about it. Side note, there has to be an expiration date on blaming your parents for things that happened in your life. <laughs> and at some point, you have to understand, they only want to do what they think is best because there are no rule books on parenting. I think that's the day I came to the understanding, and I'm forever grateful. With disappointment, you have choices. You can allow it to immobilize you, or you can use it as motivation to fuel that what you feel you deserve, want, or desire. I chose the latter. Motivated, I immediately found an agent who placed me overseas, and for the next four years, I played in five different countries. I worked on my game, and I was determined not to be denied ever again, and I wasn't. I played in the following three Olympic games, brought home 
goal to our country and hope to that community that raised me. I learned that you have to have a belief in self far greater than anyone else's disbelief. You have to remove all doubt that you are not worthy or qualified. But to do this, you have to work hard. There are no shortcuts in life. Nine times out of 10, when you've put the work in, it will work out. But that one time that it doesn't, you can't stand on principle or pride. You have to shake off the disappointment and make the adjustment. I would have to say, moving here to the University of South Carolina was the biggest adjustment I had ever make to make. I'm a Philly girl, through and through. In Philly, we're guarded, suspicious, and maybe a little paranoid. We talk fast, we walk fast, we get to the point quickly and figure if you're insulted, that was on you. You took it wrong. <laughs> but it's a little different here. People are warm and loving. They say, yes, ma'am, no, sir, hello, please, and thank you. And hello is always followed by a series of questions about your day, your family, and in my case, my team. But it's not small talk. They sincerely care. I'm guaranteed at least seven good mornings from the time I park my car to the time I arrive at the door of my office. And I've come to depend on those good mornings. But when I first arrived here, I was clearly a fish out of water. I didn't understand my team, and they didn't understand me. In Philadelphia, where I began my coaching career, if I said something slightly spirited to a player, she just mumbled something under her breath equally as spirited, and we were good. Here, if I said the same exact thing, we will all but have to stop practice so I can explain I really didn't mean that I could that you couldn't think your way out of a shoebox. It's just a figure of speech said in frustration. <laughs> For the first losing season here, I stood on principle. I had come from a winning program and I knew my methods worked. I felt with, with the players here, it would get better with time. But after the third losing season, something that had never happened in my career as a player or coach, I had to pull out the mirror again. This time, I saw me. I was the problem. I was trying to do the same thing over and over, expecting different results. It wasn't working. This wasn't Philly, and these kids weren't receptive to my style. I had to make an adjustment, and I did. The following season, I became a softer, less spirited coach. <laughs> we brought in our first in-state recruit, Elisa Welch, as well as post player Elam Ibium, guard Sherbretta Ball, and sharpshooter Tina Roy, all graduating today, by the way. We brought them in for the makings of a national championship team. Four years later, and just a little over a month ago, we represented the University of South Carolina in his first ever women's basketball Final Four. <laughs> Although we didn't win the big one, we had some of those remarkable moments. This was a historical season for many firsts, but what most notable is the way in which our run united this state. For two hours on the afternoon of April 5th, it didn't matter if you were black, white, male, female, affluent, or from the projects. It didn't even matter if you were a Clemson Tiger. If you were from the state of South Carolina, for those two hours, we were one, and we represented you. It was truly beautiful. Although the competitor in me would love to hang a national championship banner in this arena, and believe me when I say we will. It still wouldn't give me cause to define my career as successful. My conflict over using the word success as it relates to my career is wholly due on my belief that my success is really measured by those I touch and inspire. 
I really believe that's why my life and career have been about uniting people, lending hope, affecting change. I'm just this tool and basketball is the platform. So standing here today in this moment, in this arena, in this capacity, I understand why I told President Pastides yes. I believe this is an opportunity to show through my life that all things are possible. I am no different than you. I have a passion that leads and drives me. And if you have yet to find your passion, believe me, it exists. I refuse to allow disappointment to immobilize me, but instead, I'll allow it to refuel my, dis my de determination to reach my ultimate goal. And so can you, if you so choose. And when things don't go exactly as planned, because they won't, I have to make adjustments, even if that adjustment is to be made to me. By virtue of sitting here today, it's assumed you possess a strong work ethic that can be potentially weave all these things together. Now, work harder, then be present when your body of work affects change, inspires, innovates, or unites. And in 20 years, when someone calls to ask you to give the commencement address, do it. And if they want to call you success, let them. To God be the glory. Live passionately, class of 2015. Thank you so much.